Lives Matter protest in 1962 on the steps of City Hall, an image that if you put it in color could have been taken today at a similar type of protest around police brutality. We'll talk more about the cause of this protest later, its connection with housing policies and segregation from federal, state, and local governments. Excuse me. And throughout, I hope to talk about folks like Reverend Gibson, his church, Memorial AME, and so many hundreds of others of individuals in our community who came together as activists and organizers uh, to create change and that are still involved in that work and want to invite us to continue that work um, as well. And Amy, you're, you're able to invite people too as we get going? All right, good. Yes, I let people in. Oh, okay, great. All righty, here we go. And at the end, I'm looking forward to questions, comments, and uh, to hear your own stories and the way it connects. As Amy said, I'm the co-lead of the Anti-Racist Curriculum Project. Those are some of my girls uh, from my fourth grade classroom that have taught me so much and have used these stories I'm going to tell you today to change Rush Henrietta Central School District for the better. And I'm excited to tell, your, tell you their story a little bit later on. On the right uh, is my co-lead Kelly McNair and our writing team who also run professional development. We've trained almost 200 teachers since July in our three hour training on how to teach this on a culturally responsive anti-racist way uh, in multiple districts across the county. And our hope is that every kid in Monroe County would graduate knowing um, pieces of this story or all of this story and be inspired by this story to uh, change their communities and build a more just and more equitable Rochester. Some quick notes on the sources. I'm gonna be talking about The Color of Law from Richard Rothstein. He came to Rochester a few years ago with Pasto and I helped bring him here. I was on a panel with him, got to meet him and he looked through this whole presentation. He found two mistakes, but they're both fixed now. So rest assured, it was just a misspelling and a date that was off by one year. Rothstein corrected me. Now it's smiled upon by him in his infinite wisdom of redlining. If you haven't read that book, it's an absolute must read and my presentation does not come close. But what it does try to do is to take that story and directly apply it to our community here in Rochester. You're gonna see hundreds of photos from the Democrat and Chronicle archives, the New York State Commission Against Discrimination from 58, as well as oral histories from the Rochester Voices Project and a whole score of interviews that I've conducted myself with friends that are part of City Roots Community Land Trust, Beachwood, um, and a number of the other housing activist groups that I'm a part of in our community. Some definitions to center us before we begin. Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, another must read, just trying to hit you with some book recommendations. The teacher in me can't help myself. Racism is a marriage of racist policies and ideas that produce and normalize racial inequality. Notice your intention or your good heart does not matter. It's about the impact of the actions. I'll never forget in college when I told a black student I didn't see their race, that I was colorblind and I treated everyone the same. And I'll never forget the defensiveness and anger I felt when that black student turned around and told me that I was being racist with what I was saying to them. And I said, how dare you? I am such a nice person. I'm a male elementary school teacher. How could you do that? And they said, well, what you said hurt me. And that impact is what matters more. Because if you're not seeing an important part, not all, but important part of who I am, the legacy and the context that goes along with that, how can you see all of me or the racism that I deal with every day? And how can you be a part of fighting against those things? As an anti-racist, someone that produces or sustains racial equity between racial groups, curriculums, laws, processes, things that we're hoping to change in our community today as anti-racist people who actively are fighting against racist rules and ideas and are not complicit, not standing by, but active in the fight for change in our community. Another note that I think is important, I'm gonna tell a story about our community here in Rochester that hasn't often been told. And it's a story that I know I personally, when I started to learn it, felt very uncomfortable by. I saw my family and myself in this story. Uh, my story of where my wealth and privilege has come from was really challenged by this story. And in those moments where you feel a bit of defensiveness come up or a little discomfort, for whatever reason, I wanna just encourage you to pause, notice it, be curious about it, and remember this quote from Robin DiAngelo who writes, the key to moving forward is what do we do with our discomfort? Blame the messenger or disregard the message or we can use it as a door in and ask, why does this unsettle me? And what would it mean for me if this was really true? Because the thing is, in our community today, we've got big problems, but we've had huge problems related to race and racial injustice in the past. Upstate New York was an area that had uh, slavery. Enslaved African Americans uh, were forced to work for no money in our, in our community, and the legacy lives on. In the names of Henrietta, a town named after a slave owner, um, the town of Penfield, he owned human beings in the town of Penfield behind his house 
Of course, Colonel Rochester, who could not have bought his land here that became Rochesterville, then Rochester, but had him for the sale of many human beings. And he, I think he brought 13 of them to Rochester. Of course, Gates is named after a slave owner, Fitzhugh, Charles Carroll's Park. I mean, the legacy is all around us. And yet, people in our community came together, black and white, like Frederick Douglass, to fight back against slavery. Folks like Austin Stewart, enslaved in Bath and Lensotis, New York, escaped to Rochester, opened the first Black-owned business, a spot on the Underground Railroad. And on the day of abolition in New York State, he was the person who got to speak at the big governor's convention thing. Um, if it weren't for people like him and the community around him coming together to create and push for change, and then eventually lead up to our Civil War, I'm not sure where we'd be at as a country. Of course, great um, suffragists like Susan B. Anthony, who on days like today, we especially remember great innovators like George Eastman, who changed the way we see the world and yet left legacies that are a bit more complex. We're also a community with a rich civil rights legacy, from the Tollivers to the Davises, to the Riveras, to the Garcias, to the Hamptons, to the Coles, to the Knoxes, to the Coopers, to so many other names that I'm not gonna have time to get to, but I hope to tell you many of their names today and their legacy of creating Rochester where people can live where they want, um, where they can go to school where they want, and where there's actual more equity and freedom, and yet we're nowhere near close. And the thing is, that legacy must be continued. We're gonna have to come together as a community again, because the hard facts report from 2020 out of Act Rochester at the Community Foundation tells us that African-American children in our region are more than four times as likely as whites to live in poverty. And that both African-Americans and Latinos are less than half as likely to own their own homes as their white counterparts. How did we get to a community with that kind of racial injustice and disparity? So when you look at our suburbs compared to our city, in the census map, you can see just a sea of segregation in our suburbs and concentration in our inner city. In fact, New York State has the most segregated schools in the country. And Edville found in 2020 that the nation's most segregating school district border, number one, is the border between Rochester and Penfield. Brighton is number six in the United States. When it comes to life expectancy or white privilege, in Rochester, white privilege can literally mean life itself. Common Ground Health found that a child from Pittsburgh's majority white zip code born today will live up to nine years longer than a child from Rochester's previously redlined 14608 zip code. How do we get to this sort of a place where our wealth gap nationally, African Americans making 10 times less, or having 10 times less in wealth than their white counterparts in our country? We have incredible problems. Like we did with slavery in upstate New York, we can come together yet again as a community to solve these. But to do it, we have to do what Stewart, Douglas, Anthony, and so many others did, and stare these problems in the face, and live out this word and uh, just really important message from James Baldwin, which is really sort of the central message of this presentation today. And I wanna invite you to do this with me. He says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I wanna invite you to face our legacy of systemic racism, of the folks who fought back against it, and to continue on that legacy today. And I wanna remember that people of color in our community, from Douglas to Stewart to Howard Coles, have always fought against racial injustice in Rochester. They've named it, they've called it out, and they've organized to change it. This is Howard Coles, editor of the Frederick Douglass Voice newspaper on Clarissa Street, Redline neighborhood of the city. After redlining, which we'll get to later, started, Howard Coles took note, and he and his paper had a 12-point program to fight racism in Rochester, and the number one thing was addressing housing. Howard Coles did a massive housing study that the city later duplicated and found was absolutely accurate, finding that African Americans were forced to live in just two neighborhoods, that over half of the homes in those neighborhoods weren't habitable for human beings to live in, over 30% didn't have running water, many didn't have heat, and yet, as Howard Cole spoke out, even getting his articles in the DNC, nothing was done by our city, uh, county, and suburban leaders. Dr. Anthony Jordan later spoke out again, um, building on the work of Coles, finding that housing was directly linked uh, to uh, high death rates. Again, white privilege literally being life itself in Rochester. Finding that in Rochester, the black death rate from all causes was 50% higher than that of whites. And the tuberculosis death rate among people of color in Rochester was two and one half times that of whites. Today, the COVID death rate in Rochester is three times higher for African Americans. How far have we come? Rochester's NAACP fought back against these health equity issues. 
and one of the leaders of, of creating health inequity was the University of Rochester, whose medical program and hospital had extremely um, segregating and racist policies. In fact, Dean Whipple at the U of R would not allow students of color into the medical or nursing programs. Folks like Dr. Knox, Dr. Lunsford, Harper Sibley at the NAACP fought for over 10 years, eventually suing and forcing U of R to allow one black student in each year. I think in 2016, the Rochester Medical Journal found that only 87 black males um, had graduated from uh, the University of Rochester Medical School out of almost 8,000 graduates, staggering. 46, almost 10 years later after Howard Cole started fighting redlining, Reverend Body spoke out again saying, the housing situation has been an enigma to people of color. In Rochester, only two areas have gracefully been made available for him. And if any attempt is made to move out of these black ghettos, that attempt is met with opposition. And today we're going to look specifically at those opposition and the policies that created our segregation and the racial wealth, health equity disparity that we see today, as well as educational disparity, of course. We're gonna look at racist policies in the real estate industry, the code of ethics, something called a racial restrictive covenant and a deed for homes thousands across our county, redlining, which came out of the 1934 National Housing Act and the VA and FHA backed mortgages that were part of it and for whites only, We'll look at urban renewal and displacement, highway construction in our community, exclusionary zoning, and uh, anti-school integration protests that occurred in Rochester. But a quick note before we begin, the period of time we're gonna cover is called the Great Migration. From 1910 to 70, millions of African Americans fled the South to the North in search of better jobs, fleeing from white domestic terrorists like the Klan and citizens councils that made life incredibly difficult in places. But they didn't come to work at jobs at Kodak um, or Bausch and Long. In fact, uh, a New York State commission in 39 found that uh, no people of color worked at those places. Kodak had one, Bausch and Long had zero African Americans that worked there. Instead, a majority of African Americans moved from Sanford, Florida to pick fruit in Rochester's suburbs and rural areas. Sanford, Florida was where the head of the Florida's NAACP had his home firebomb, Jackie Robinson, run out of town. Um, it was a Klan capital of the South. And people were fleeing racism, trying to find something better in Rochester. And what they found was different, but quite a bit racist. Because in town, when they tried to rent or buy a home, they ran into the real estate industry, governed by the National Association of Real Estate Boards, Rochester Chapter. And for more than 30 years, their code of ethics rooted on page one in the golden law from the Bible. On page 15 or 16, it goes into what that really means, that a realtor will lose their license if they, if they don't follow this. They should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality, or individuals whose presence will be clearly detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. You'll lose your job if you show a black person a home in a white neighborhood. Meet Frank Drone, the head of our real estate board for a number of years, uh, who later went on to do quite a bit in our community. Frank Drum uh, was responsible for enforcing this. He did. Howard Coles, who met just a few slides back, uh, the black editor of the newspaper, got his real estate license to fight back against this. He started showing homes to black people in white neighborhoods. And very quickly, Drum and his friends in the real estate industry forced him out of the real estate industry, preventing him from doing this, and kept Rochester locked up tight when it came to what neighborhoods African Americans could live in, the third and seventh ward, which we'll talk more about. To show you some other examples of folks of color who tried to go to real estate agents and find a place to live, Dr. Walter Cooper, PhD at U of R, he describes his experience like this. I confronted housing segregation. It was 1954 and the wife and I answered ads for 69 apartments and we were refused at all of them. One of those apartments they were refused at was from Max Farish of Amico and Farish, one of the biggest builders in Rochester at the time and a name that's still quite well known. This was common from the greats to the littlest people in the real estate industry to even someone, um, a PhD like Dr. Cooper and his wife with a master's degree and job at Kodak were denied. Meet Alice Young, um, later became the first black principal in the city school district, the founder of Monroe Community College. Well, in 1957, her and her husband, James, they were middle, upper middle class folks said, you know what, we want more yard, we want some more room, we wanna to go to the 19th ward. Uh, but no real estate agent in town would show them a home. They followed the code of ethics. Not a single bank would pre-approve them for a mortgage. So Alice did what um, the 57 other people of color did at this time. They found a wealthy white person at the NAACP, like their friend Harper Sibley, 
of the uh, Western Union Telegraph fortune, who bought them a house on Millbank Street in the 19th Ward. They moved in in the middle of the night because they were afraid of their white neighbors. Sure enough, the next morning, this incredibly horrific note was in their mailbox. They faced years of racial terror from their neighbors. Many neighbors moved out because the Youngs moved in and their children. But the Youngs refused to leave, and they stayed there for 17 years. When I've had lunch with Dr. Young, she's asked me that when I share her story, I mentioned the one white family on the street, the Bushes, who stood by the Youngs and helped them stand up to the abuse and terror that they face and helped them stay there for that over 17 years, raising their sons. An incredible lady, she wrote a book, it's the library. I can't recommend it enough to hear her story and her work in education and altogether her work continued today at MCC for our community. I also don't think of Rochester that was planned country. You're like, oh, maybe that was like a prank in her mailbox. Nope, this is the paper in 1926, 8,000 Klansmen in full hooded regalia burning 50 foot high crosses in East Rochester in John Ott's Field, what's today the practice field for the East Rochester football team. Um, the next day, you can see if you look really close in the bottom, over 20,000 Klansmen swarmed the field for the Klansmen parade right down Main Street in full hoods. The next area of racist policy in our community was called something called racially restrictive covenants. So, when you buy a home, you get a deed to your home that says it's proof that you own it. And every deed has rules. Sometimes there's not a lot of rules, but sometimes there's rules like you can see number four, any detached garage should comply with all these requirements. It's got to be, you know, so far from the lot line or, you know, things like you can't have pigs in your backyard or no distilleries, like things we're kind of glad our neighbors can't be having. But if you look there for number five, it says the dwelling shall be occupied by persons of the Caucasian race only. This was legally enforceable all the way until the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And people were enforcing these nationally and right here in Rochester. This summer, my students, myself, my friends at City Roots Land Trust and uh, the students at Yale Environmental Protection Clinic at the law school there, we published a massive report documenting these covenants and what we can do about them. And I wanna show you some of the research of my students and friends about this effort in our community and the way it segregated it. In fact, it goes all the way to the top. County manager himself, Clarence Smith, on hundreds of homes, at least that we know of in Irondequoit, he put this covenant in 39 and 1940, saying no person of any race other than the Caucasian race shall use or occupy any building or lot. Oh, but don't prevent your domestic servants from being black. That's okay. You can see his signature, the entire legislator and a legislative record voted in the affirmative for this racist policy to be put on county tax foreclosed properties. Frank Drum, that real estate agent you met earlier, he was one of the people who bought those homes and agreed to those covenants. This is though happened all across our community. You notice that Italians, Polish, Jewish people are included like at this neighborhood in Webster. In Brighton, Meadowbrook neighborhood, over 371 homes, carefully planned neighborhood. In fact, it was so carefully planned that when Kodak built these homes, Vice President Harry Haight, um, and ESL Bank, who was created solely to finance these homes for its all white employees, wrote into every single deed on every home in one big swoop. It said no lot or dwelling shall be sold to or occupied by a black person. This is Kodak. We've got the county, we've got Kodak. And notice, in case you weren't sure about that comment I made earlier about Kodak, you can see here, right from the report in 1939, that Kodak of their 16,000 employees had one black porter and Bausch and Lomb had zero. But it wasn't just Kodak, it was builders all across our community, like here in Brighton, and even things like the DNC. This is Council Rock Estates. Notice the DNC advertised these as having rigid restrictions for desirable social character. And you can go down to the county clerk's office. These are still on all these deeds. They have not been taken off. They're no longer enforceable, but they're still there. School districts got involved, like Thomas Edison School Number Four, now Hope Hall and Gates, um, saying no lot uh, should ever be used or occupied by members of any race. That's the jury school segregation right there in Rochester. All the homes around Oak Hill also advertised that way in the paper. Parenting, East Rochester. Notice Italians and Polish people uh, couldn't live there at first, but if they'd assimilated, they could. So. A lot of people say, oh, my family, they came here from you know, Eastern Europe, we were discriminated against. Absolutely awful, right? But they had the opportunity to become white, whereas people of color did not. And you can see it right here in deeds like these and these covenants. Here in Irondequoit, Grafton Johnson put over 2,000 of these covenants in that entire neighborhood in Northwest Irondequoit. 
that whole Somerville area, St. Paul area. And one of those homes was sold to a very famous Rochesterian, founder of Wegmans, Walter Wegman, who agreed to this racist covenant and ensured that it stayed on the home when he sold it. I could keep going though, of course, Penfield, multiple neighborhoods, quite a few neighborhoods throughout Greece. You can see the head of the Builders Association was involved, Norman Huck. He put over 250 of these racist deeds on the properties he built, Brooklyn Estates by Brooklyn Country Club and Gates. Of course, the president of the Rochester Bar also did this early up case on the homes that he helped build. This kind of thing went all the way to the top throughout the city, and including in the 19th Ward, where Judge David, Judge Reuben Davis described his experience like this. He said, my wife and I were looking for a house. It was 1958, and we saw a house we liked on 135 Elmdorf Avenue in Rochester, just a block or so west of Genesee. That's an important street to remember. He said, the owner refused to sell to us because we were black and a restrictive covenant was on the deed that these houses when built couldn't be sold to black or Italian people. A note in 1944, Jewish, Italian, Eastern European folks with the passing of the GI Bill were legally deemed white and no longer not the Caucasian race. And now they were legally able to get FHA or VA mortgages to buy homes subsidized by the federal government. Black GIs who came back from World War II were not included in uh, these fed this federal loan program, which we'll talk more about later. So how did Davis fight back against this and end up moving into this home? Well, he had to be wily. He writes, I was active in the NAACP at the time and a white friend bought the house, transferred it to me. So we had to go through kind of devious methods in order to find housing. He says, I think it was pretty typical and a difficulty for getting de decent, safe housing for. To my knowledge, there were very few persons of color living in these towns, very few in Henrietta, none in Pittsburgh, very few in Irondequoit, none in the town of Webster, in the towns west of the city, base, Grates, and Greece, practically none. And here are, you can see our map of all the places that have these covenants. About 5,000 or so homes, we estimate there's up to at least 20,000 across Greater Rochester. We're working with students at U of R and RIT, um, to document these and we're building a website um, with part of our curriculum project where you can go on and click on any neighborhood and see where those covenants are coming soon. The next area of racist policy was the New Deal. Meet Franklin Roosevelt, former governor of New York State, also, often seen as a liberal hero, a strong Democrat, a northern elite, right? The, you know, the guy in the Hudson River. Well, in 1934, it's the wake of the Great Depression, trying to get out of it, he passes this massive housing act to help with a housing crisis. Him and Senator Wagner, the guy in the glasses, also from New York State. This act changes our country forever, especially Rochester. If this law doesn't get passed, towns like Penfield, Webster, Pittsburgh, Gates, Greece, they would have just been tiny little villages with you know five to 10,000 people. But after this law, towns ballooned, growing by tens and tens of thousands of people, thanks to the federal government subsidizing home construction and mortgage insurance for exclusively white families. It creates the 30-year mortgage, the low fixed interest rate, and written right into the underwriting manual for how this law would be carried out, it said this. If a neighborhood is to retain stability, it's necessary properties continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. A change in social or racial occupancy leads to instability and a reduction in values. It goes on to say, the FHA underwriting manual, that deed restrictions should be imposed on all land in the immediate environment. So everything that you saw there, if a new builder wants to build a home after 1939 um, and they want federal financing, they gotta put racial covenants prohibiting the occupancy of properties except by the race for which they are intended. So it went from something that people like Kodak did on their own, by the time of the 30s, people like Huck, they were doing it because they were benefiting from the government because they did it, not just the community who wanted it. So we don't think about big hardcore racists as FDRs, as people from New York State. We love to talk about them as Southerners, the George Wallace types, slave owners in the South, not slave owners here, right? But Kendi gives us a different way to think about it in his master, incredible book, Stamp from the Beginning. He writes, time and again, powerful and brilliant men and women have produced racist ideas to justify the racist policies of their era. My fourth graders ask me every year, why are people racist? And I say greed and wealth and power is always behind this. It's not ignorance. It's not just hate. It's because, it's because of profit. It's because of gain. 
FDR isn't seen this way, and yet what he did changed the lives of families like my own. Put another way, Kendi's statement, in the book, So You Want to Talk About Race, I really love this. The author writes, the ultimate goal of racism was the profit and comfort of white race, specifically of rich white men. Like myself, my dad, and both my grandparents, both grandparents received FHA and VA mortgages for no or very little money down. There were 30-year mortgages subsidized by the federal government that allowed them to buy homes that maybe they could not have afforded otherwise. They built incredible wealth. My grandfather's home in Greece quadrupled in value and allowed him to build incredible wealth, to send my aunt and my mom to college, to help send me to college. When I crashed my car as a young teacher with no money in the bank, a check was in the mail the next day to help me pay for the cost of the repairs and get to work so I didn't have to take an hour bus ride to where my school would have been, right? And that's that cushion that wealth gives us. And we know that in our country, wealth is rooted in home ownership. And home ownership in our country is rooted in the National Housing Act of 1934, which is rooted in white supremacy. And the way this racist policy was enforced was through something called redlining or residential security maps, which the government had made in almost every city nationwide. Neighbors, neighborhoods were surveyed, carefully detailed, street by street, and given a rating. Green and blue meant best, most desirable. Mortgages can be given to white people in these neighborhoods because they're already 100% white neighborhoods, um, or they have protections from people of color being able to move in. Yellow meant declining neighborhoods, maybe older homes, immigrants, day laborers, and red meant hazardous. If even one black, Italian, or Jewish person lived there, it got that red rating hazardous. So let's take a look at some of these assessors reports from the government. This is Corn Hill, the red line 14608 where people are living nine years less than people live in Pittsburgh up today. In this neighborhood, notice in the, in the 30s, it was 75% black, 10% foreign. Take a look at those incomes. Compare that to Pittsburgh. Do you notice a difference? 0% black, 0% foreign, business people, quadruple the income. Also, every one of these homes on East Avenue Estates is by Oak Hill. It has a racial restrictive covenant barring white people from living there which also helped with this rating. Compare my neighborhood in Beechwood by School 33, deemed hazardous because it was 2% black and 30% foreign. Whereas Meadowbrook, the Kodak neighborhood, 20 years after its construction, is still 0% black and deemed green-lined or best. All suburbs, which were small villages at the time, were officially green-lined. And in fact, this policy worked so well that in 1960, while these suburbs exploded in population, the most integrated suburb of Rochester with the most black people was Henrietta, with only 11 individual people of color. Dr. Walter Cooper, good friend of mine, never forgot that experience in 1954, and he and his wife Helen said, we're not going to be treated like this. So they organized with friends at the NAACP, and they moved in together to Henrietta, a small group of them, you can see 11, to try to say, you know what, we're not going to let this stand. Dr. Cooper says the only reason they moved to Henrietta was not because they loved Henrietta, but because it was the only place they could go because of how low the population was and how little organized um, the racist white folks were in that town. Not that they didn't face abuse. I wanna give you some more scope and scale. This is Richard Rothstein's Color of Law, and it's really staggering these statistics. So make sure you let them sink in. He writes, the FHA and VA insured half of all new mortgages nationwide, half during this 30 to 40 year period of time giving out over $119 billion, and this is an old money, in mortgage insurance. Rita is handouts exclusively to white families. And if you doubt it, Rothstein writes, of the 35 million families that benefited from these loans, 98% were white. That 2% was in the late 60s with some of these policies in some states started to get pulled back before the law changed. Which brings me now to the theater community in Rochester and something that was happening at all of our schools, our stages, our Kiwanis clubs, our Grange halls, our town halls, our Catholic and Protestant churches, called a blackface minstrel show. Originated in the early 1800s, were huge in Rochester from 1900 to the late 1960s. This happened almost every year in every town. The DNC and local papers published stories about these, proudly celebrating the white supremacy and explicitly racist messages that were being taught in these schools and public spaces. This is Honeyway Falls in 1960, hosting a blackface minstrel show. And almost every blackface show had a similar sort of pattern to it. 
Um, local actors with black in their faces with burnt cork, paint on garish red lips, wear white gloves, and they would dance and sing racist songs. The main characters' names themselves were racist. Jim Crow, Jim C-O-O-N, Jim Dandy, Mr. Bones, Old Black Joe. I mean, my elementary school in Webster in 1964, I, I gave this talk a couple years ago, and an older gentleman in the back said, in third grade, I was in blackface as Old Black Joe right there in the cafetorium, which is where I ate lunch. I never learned this story. And these were huge, teaching a message of contempt and hate for people of color and showing a real context of welcome for the racist policies of redlining. Notice here in Charlotte High School, the principal actually leading these shows for over two decades, Barnard Fire Department, uh, Webster Fire Department, the Women's Fire Auxiliary would put these on. Uh, just incredible stuff. Kodak had an annual minstrel show, proudly published these photos in their magazine that were sent out to their thousands of employees celebrating the way they thought and also sending that message about who it is that is allowed to be hired. Jewish community was involved, having an annual show at Lindhurst Theater, their blackface show with the Jewish Youth Association. RCSD, school number five, 44, John Marshall, Jefferson, this stuff was huge. Allendale Private School in Pittsburgh had an annual show. You could even have one of their shows at the Memorial Art Gallery in University Avenue. The Catholic Parish in Pittsburgh in the 50s had their annual show. So did the Masons, Newark Junior High School, RIT had an annual show. Um, and here's some of the other towns that hosted a show almost every single year in our community. And it's amazing that I was 26 years old when I stumbled across this accidentally in the newspaper archives at the library. And I was like, oh, yeah, that can't be something that happens. And then I start looking, and there are thousands of articles about these shows in our paper. This was something that from the top to the bottom of the community, people participated in. And of course, people of color spoke up. In 61, the NAACP carried on an almost 10-year campaign to end these racist shows. And in this letter to the editor of the DNC, it really exemplifies what is so messed up. They write, blackface shows must be banned from all public and private schools, churches, and public buildings. To do otherwise will cripple permanently the attitudes of all white youth involved in these community accepted shows towards all the dark skinned people of the world. Reverend Quentin Primo, who I'll mention later in this presentation, who dealt with some housing issues as well. So people of color fought back. They're, they're pushing back against these shows, against the housing, against the slum conditions that were being created from the disinvestment and the lack of wealth that they were being allowed to create because they're not getting these subsidies or access to home ownership or access to you know these new thriving suburbs and their activism led to something we often get another commission another report instead of action and i so hope uh, that this raised commission that's happening right now will not just be a commission but will truly be a beginning of significant and radical policy change in our community unlike this report in 58 which really didn't make a big difference then, it makes a big difference for us in helping us understand how redlining specifically impacted our community in nitty gritty details. Because we can't just look at anecdotes, we can't just look at policies, we have to look at actual data to see how it played out. And that's so important. And I tell my students that every year, we have to look at things from multiple angles. And I think you'll find this is quite convincing. In fact, in 1950, Monroe County, 80% of its people of color lived in just two neighborhoods, the redlined third and seventh wards, just as Howard Coles and Dr. Knox had talked about in the 30s and 40s. More than 1,600 of these units had no bathrooms or shared bathrooms. In more than 2,000 units, there was more than one person living in each room. Leading Connie Mitchell to become our first person of color to ever be elected to public office. Again, another name, but growing up in elementary and high school, I never heard the name of Connie Mitchell. And yet she is a hero in the Rochester community. She ran for public office at a time when it was terrifying to do so. In fact, the reason she ran is because not a single man of color in our community would run. It was much too afraid. And Connie Mitchell said, you know what, I'm going to do it. Um, because she didn't have a job that she was afraid of losing the way so many men like Dr. Cooper had. She writes, the reason she ran, the biggest reason was redlining, saying we were living in a community bursting at the seams because there wasn't open housing. When John and I bought our house in Greg Street, the real estate agent told us, I can't show you houses west of Jefferson. They're not open to blacks. So we were confined from Jefferson back to the river to look for a place to live on the west side of the city. After two tries, she beat out Lester Peck and she started trying to make positive change in our community. Her legacy lives on. 
In the seventh and third wards, the report found that over 30% of units had no running water, something 20 years prior, Howard Coles and the city had found in their big housing studies, and yet still nothing had changed. This disinvestment from redlining led to incredible lead poisoning, a landlord a dereliction of properties, a huge rat infestations, thousands of rats, children getting bitten, thousands of evictions happening in these neighborhoods and people being forced to pack tighter and tighter into homes, five families living in a home meant for one family in our community. Meanwhile, the more middle, upper middle class people of color who tried to make it out of these neighborhoods and take a stand like the Coopers with the biases faced incredible violence and white resistance and pressure to stay out of white neighborhoods, which helped explain also that only 11 black people lived in Henrietta, uh, the most integrated suburb of Rochester. So meet the biases. They move into West Irondequoit in the early 60s. And very quickly in West Irondequoit, rocks get thrown through their window. They face racial terror, threats of violence. They sell their house and they join the Coopers and the Lees and Henrietta. Not willing to give up, but not saying that it's not worth it to deal with that kind of abuse. The report talks about Dick Ricketts, the star of our NBA team here in Rochester, picture in the middle. Dick Ricketts, he was the star, and yet it took him 16 months to find a suitable apartment in Rochester, even with all of his fame and his money. Peter Tolliver, a scientist, bought a house in Brighton, Bruna Drive. The majority of his neighbors came together before the deal was signed, and they tried to buy the house out from under him with the bank by pooling their money together. Originally, they were successful until Tolliver, the NAACP, and I think one of the synagogues in Brighton got involved and helped get the Tollivers back their home. The Primos, who you met, you met earlier against the blackface shows, in the early 60s, Quentin Primo tried to get a rectory in East Irondequoit uh, to you know, a home to live in. And all of the neighbors on the street, over 100 people signed a petition saying they didn't want the bank to let them have the mortgage because when they moved in, they'd be loud and dirty and throw all night drinking parties. That's a quote from the petition. And they were denied access to living in Irondequoit. Meanwhile, it found that not a single FHA or VA loan was given to any person of color in any of Rochester suburbs, at least, at least, we're not sure about after, until 1958, staggering. Meanwhile, wealthy builders like the Farishes, the Hawks, the Drums, they made millions. In 73, Farish had made over $100 million in the real estate industry, money that he and his peers in the real estate could never have made if it hadn't been for massive federal subsidies that allowed them to build homes and allowed people to have access to being able to purchase those homes through federally subsidized insured mortgages and building materials. Meanwhile, towns like Pittsburgh grew from having only 9,000 residents to over 25,000 residents. Barrel Architecture and their historic survey in 2017 of Pittsburgh, they themselves in the Pittsburgh survey say that Pittsburgh would not have grown the way it did if it hadn't been massive federal policies of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. The next thing that's going on is urban renewal. Because you create redlining and disinvestment, you pack a bunch of people into one neighborhood or two neighborhoods, massive overcrowding, and you get all kinds of issues. Um, and so the solution wasn't to make better homes or to hold landlords accountable or give people of color access to other places to live. Instead, urban renewal, which people of color, like at fight at the time, referred to as black folk removal. And this was pretty common across the country. The federal government, through HUD, they gave out millions of dollars, including to Rochester, who got a $30 million grant to build 490, the inner loop, and to tear down houses and churches and neighborhoods and allow uh, you know, white-owned businesses to be put up and people who are white in the suburbs to make it downtown. You can see here Elmer Milliman, president of Central Trust Bank, which was eventually became part of M&T Bank, um, and John Dale from the city, and their whites-only commission drawing up these plans. Activists like Coles tried to get on these commissions, but were denied because of the color of their skin. This urban renewal led to 886 families being forced out of their homes and displaced. But they didn't go to Webster or Penfield, they went to Jefferson Avenue in, in these Genesee streets, where white families whose homes now didn't have value because of redlining, decided they could cash in by turning single family homes into five family apartments, leading to massive overcrowding and incredibly difficult slum conditions. In the 60s, over 850 families were pushed out of their home in the Third War, 250 in the area that is now where Strong Museum in Manhattan Square is located. And it's just staggering the, the, the damage that this did. The other thing that happened is that when you have this level of segregation in a community, and you have a group of people forced into just two places, living on top of each other, 
in, in, in slum conditions because there's disinvestment, not because the people aren't taking care of their properties, the landlords aren't, but not the individuals of color who are living there, you have huge problems, right? And so oftentimes in our community, instead of doing the obvious thing, like helping people get safe and affordable housing, we increase budgets of our police. And RPD started to grow during this period of time. And the areas that got the heaviest policing, just like today, are those red line neighborhoods of the city. And when you over police certain neighborhoods because of conditions that the white leaders created, you get problems like Rufus Farewell on the right, sitting in a wheelchair because he was brutally beaten for locking up a gas station he managed on Plymouth and Columbia Avenue, a red line neighborhood, the Plymouth Exchange neighborhood. He's there to protest at City Hall because he was, because he was black, was seen as robbing a gas station, right? So the police brutally beat him, took him down to the station, kept beating him, and Eventually, massive protests like this one led by Reverend Gibson erupted at City Hall, demanding justice um, and the firing of these police officers. Cooper and many others were a part of this protest. This is 1962, but you could see this in 2020, right? And in fact, similar protests did happen at City Hall in 2020. And I think it's important to notice that connection between segregation, both past and present, and the relationship between policing. I could easily do another hour on that, but we absolutely don't have time. Of course, policing, disinvestment, lack of running water, displacement from urban renewal, all of these things lead to a rebellion, an uprising in 1964. Some have called it a riot. Lots of different names, different people have that were there, prefer to call it. But essentially what happened is over a thousand people were arrested. It lasted over three days. 1,500 National Guard troops were called out to Rochester to quell the protest. And afterwards, significant changes started happening. Fight flight, but also policy started to change too, because it wasn't just Rochester that uprose into the streets. It was almost every red line neighborhood in almost every city nationwide. And after Dr. King was assassinated in 68, rebellions, uprisings, and riots erupted nationally yet again, allowing Lyndon Johnson to ram through the incredibly weak but important 68 Fair Housing Act which outlawed redlining and covenants, gave people of color access to federally financed mortgages and VA mortgages for the first time ever. Um, the other thing it did is it gave HUD, and just HUD, Housing and Urban Development, the power to take funds away from communities that were failing to affirmatively further integration. Now, George Romney, one of the first secretaries of HUD after this happened, um, working for President Nixon, started to enforce it. He'd seen the riots in Michigan where he was governor, and he went after white towns that were refusing to do this and started to try to take away funding. After just that thought that funding might get taken away, white folks freaked out. President Nixon fired Romney and ordered that this act not be enforced. In fact, Nicole Hannah-Jones at the New York Times has found that since President Nixon, until Barack Obama, Funds were taken away from communities failing to affirmatively further integration only two times. In justifying it, Nixon says something that many of our suburban town board and town supervisors easily, easily could be heard saying and have been heard saying in the last few years. He says, I'm convinced that legal segregation is wrong, but forced integration of housing or education, it's just as wrong, even though it wasn't when it was created, right? when it was segregation. He says, I realize this position will lead us to a situation in which black people will continue to live for the most part in black neighborhoods, like the city of Rochester, as it still is today, and will be predominantly black schools and predominantly white schools, like the school I grew up in in Webster, where I never had a black teacher, where I sat next to two students of color in all 12 years of my high school education. I mean, speaking truth. The final area I want to talk about is education. And a lot of people love to think about, you know, the North didn't have any problems with school integration. That's something from the South, like Elizabeth Eckford here in the Little Rock Nine trying to go to school. We've all seen this famous picture from 1957. But this picture could have been taken in Rochester if we'd had a better photographer. Gannett did have some photographers, or they wrote stories about massive protests when school integration began in Rochester. Because in Rochester, in the inner city schools of the inner inner city, these were 90, 95% black schools, whereas the outer ring schools would be 100% white in RCSD. In 62, Dr. Cooper and many others filed the Aiken lawsuit against the city school district, and it took them 10 years to start to implement their inter integration policy. You can see 150 youth and parents protesting 
even the fact that black students might be able to go to Marshall High School. In 1971, though, the city school district, and here's our Elizabeth Eckford photograph, although the photographer didn't show the students of color walking into Charlotte High School in 71, but a mob of white parents and students led by in the middle Mary Nicolisi, who many suspect was one of the Klan leaders for Rochester, and a big leader of the parent group against integration in Rochester, um, were heckling and harassing, throwing bricks, rocks, and bottles at black youth as they got on and off the buses. Parents and youth would hide at the Holy Sepulchral Cemetery, um, and they would throw bricks and rocks at school buses carrying black children coming into Charlotte during school integration. Incredible issues happened in this area. In fact, James Beard, president of the Black Student Union at Charlotte High School in 71, he said, we were on the bus, and as soon as we got to the graveyard on Lake Avenue, they would hide in a graveyard behind the wall, and they'd come out from behind the wall, they'd throw bricks and rocks, iron, anything they could find at the bus, they bust the windows and people would start screaming. Now, this is like Little Rock Nine, except this is Rochester, New York. And then this is a story that I didn't know until last year, right? And this was something that happened. And I think the story of folks like Charlotte's Black Student Union, which organized to protect black students, they would make sure um, that black women always had escorts going through the hallways. In fact, in one instance, the black students at Charlotte locked themselves in the auditorium because they were so afraid of what was happening with the white students at that school. And now there was violence on both sides. It was wild, uh, the, the things that were happening at that time, but it's a story that we have not talked about enough or looked at in our community. And in fact, that integration effort was largely disbanded a year later as the school board kind of let it go after white parents protested. Justin Murphy is writing a book on this. I've read the manuscript. It's incredible. Hopefully it'll come out this spring. And when it does, I hope everyone reads it. Um, the final piece I want to talk about, though, as we come to our end, is exclusionary suburban zoning, which exists to this day in all of our suburbs. In the 60s, in response to the civil rights movement, the all-white town zoning boards and town planning boards, like this one in Penfield in 65, they heard hundreds of white folks come to their town board meetings and submit petitions saying, we don't want black people in our town. And the tool we think we should, you should use to keep people of color out of towns like Penfield is zoning. These towns didn't have much zoning beforehand, rules for how land can be used, right? Oftentimes, you just don't want a factory next to homes or, you know, a big, you know, car dealership next to homes. Um, but they decided, no, we want to use class because we know we can't exclude against race anymore. That's starting to become out of the, of, of not allowed. But the Fair Housing Act allows you to exclude based on class. So let's make our lot sizes really big so that homes have to be very expensive and we don't allow any kind of apartments to get built in towns like Penfield or townhouses and absolutely no federally subsidized affordable housing like white people got it, you know, Norton Village or Chatham Gardens or Seth Green or Cobbs Hill. We're not going to allow those to be built in the suburbs. In fact, zoning ordinances, this is what they're really about, says Seymour Cher, who in 67 was fighting with the suburbs to change these racist zoning policies, really kind of calling them out for what they were. He said, these ordinances, they're only a reflection of the willingness of communities surrounding Rochester to allow residential living for all income groups. And in Penfield, which had some of the most exclusionary policies, we've got it in black and white um, from town board member Walter Peter, who said he had 46 residents call to ask um, if a proposal to include affordable housing in the land use plan is going to be a wedge to bring black people into their town. Peter, who was on the board, said we need to listen to these residents when it comes to these plans. And Penfield did. In 75, with Worth B. Selden, Penfield was brought all the way to the Supreme Court by activists from Metro Act who failed in trying to successfully sue Penfield. But it didn't make it to the Supreme Court, which is a fascinating story, and it was on technicalities that they lost. Now in 68, Pittsburgh, after the assassination of MLK, some of the pastors in Pittsburgh, they said, whoa, we had no idea racism was such a problem. They started to speak out. The Reverend Hughes uh, was, was part of this group of clergymen in Pittsburgh who drew up this 12-point platform for social action. He goes, you know, um, the killing of Dr. King has made people here aware. We're ashamed, we're angry. We weren't more sensitive and aware. If this is bigotry, it's bigotry out of plain ignorance. So what's going on today in 2020? Like if, if they weren't aware, but they were after Dr. King, you know what I mean? What, what happened after, you know, each instance when these things happen in our community, people talk about it and then it goes away. But if we're gonna make real change in our community, if we're gonna make a dent in the lack of affordable housing, 
almost none in the suburbs, a shortage of 28,000 affordable housing in Rochester, and more than 9,000 evictions happening every year. If we're gonna make any bit of a dent, we're gonna to have to do some type of radical change in our policy that is truly equitable and anti-racist. Policy as radical as the New Deal, where $119 billion was set aside exclusively for white families to buy homes. We have not yet done anything like that to help people of color have access to home ownership and wealth the way that white folks have. And because of that, because of our failure to face these issues in our community and learn from our history, our community is marred by segregation today. Our wealth is hoarded in our suburbs, as you can see here, and poverty is incredibly concentrated in those redlined neighborhoods. The same goes with a redlining map to owner occupancy of homes and modern day redlining that can no longer be explicitly race-based, but still in those black neighborhoods and those redlined neighborhoods where Empire Justice found loan denial rates um, were incredibly high, actually the highest in those previously redlined neighborhoods. Same with the New York Federal Reserve, finding there's almost no access to credit in these predominantly black neighborhoods of Rochester today. Same with food deserts and food insecurity. We know, we know this, we don't have Wegmans or nice grocery stores in any of these predominantly black redlined neighborhoods. They were designed this way. Asthma, incredibly, incredibly high rates in these redlined neighborhoods. Same with high blood pressure, same with life expectancy being so much lower. A recent report finding that current residents of city neighborhoods historically redlined, they've got a life expectancy of five years shorter than those in neighborhoods coded green, the highest rating. And when it comes to COVID-19, four of the five zip codes with the most cases per 100,000 residents were redlined. Finally, this gap, this thing that I think is one of the most important pieces is wealth. Yale found in 2017 that for every $100 an average white family has in wealth, the average black family has only five. In fact, it's gonna take black families 228 years to earn the same amount of wealth that white families have today. No amount of picking yourself up by our bootstraps can make up for that much of a gap or for the incredibly racist housing policies that I hope you join me in doing what James Baldwin asked and facing it today. A reminder, Baldwin writes, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed till it is faced. And I hope you've had the courage and the wherewithal to stick with me today as we face racist policy in the real estate industry's code of ethics, like Howard Coles did when he's got his real estate license and then lost it for showing black people homes in white neighborhoods. The way folks like Judge Davis fought racial covenants, the way redlining has been fought by Connie Mitchell, Alice Young, Dr. Cooper, the biases, the Lees, and so many others. The way urban renewal was fought by thousands protesting in 1964 in the streets and police brutality. The way exclusionary suburban zoning policy was fought by Metro Act in the 70s, and hopefully by some of you today, folks like Kevin Beckford, Folks like Matthew Brown and Fairport are trying to create changes when it comes to the way um, we zone our communities and allow for access, for opportunity and choice when it comes to where people want to live. But for any of this to happen, we have to choose to face it. And Brian Stevenson gives us this quote to think about. He says, you have to commit to truth telling first. You can't jump to reconciliation and solutions until you tell the truth. You don't have to go outside your own institution. You can begin with your own truth telling. And for me, I've told you some of my story, the way my wealth has come from Red Lion. It wasn't my fault, but it's part of my story. And a part of my story I have to tell this truth about, and I have to take into consideration when I decide who I vote for, and what sort of policies I support and organize and have an activist around. And one of those policies is curriculum. And in the spirit of folks like Cooper and Hannah Storrs who fought to get Little Black Sambo, a racist book out of city schools, and to get black contributions in our history textbooks, I've helped create a project that teaches this story to kids through inquiry, through uh, using the New York State Social Studies standards, um, and who puts primary sources in front of kids to help them draw their own conclusions about this story instead of what I did to you tonight. I, I definitely kind of told you my thoughts about this story. That's not what we're training teachers to do. And that's not what our team of experts and anti-racist educators has built. Instead, we pulled together this amazing team as well as a board of community leaders from all across our community, both school districts, um, private organizations, universities, New York State Regents, an incredible group of folks, current day activists, past activists like Cooper and Coles, um, to come together and create a curriculum um, for kids that helps them learn about their community, 
decide what they want to do about current day problems that we saw today in that hard facts report and to learn about the causes and redlining and racial problems. The kids get exposed to definitions from Ibram Kendi. They don't have to agree with them. They get to put it in their own words, talk about it with themselves and their own experiences and have that chance to bump up against it using restorative practices and dialogue where they learn how to have these conversations in a safe way, in a responsive way, but in a way that truly prepares them to be a part of our country and our democracy. And the moment that we're in right now, where we are so divided, I mean, not that we weren't much divided, any less divided, I think, in the past, but we didn't talk about race. Growing up in Webster, I don't think I heard anything about racism unless it was about something in the South related to Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. Never here. And we have to teach kids, how do you have these conversations and how do you listen? How do you think critically when you look at these primary sources? Are they credible? What's the mystery, the purpose of the source? What's the context and the connector? And they get four different little superheroes to think about it. And they look at the population map, the redlining map, they look at multiple different perspectives like a jigsaw puzzle and they connect their ideas. They read each other's thinking. They share with each other the reactions and thoughts and they used to learn texts to draw their own conclusions, to build on their own experiences and those of local activists. We read children's books that Dr. Cooper and I have, write, have written about his life and Connie Mitchell's life um, to teach these kids about the ways you can change your community based on what they did. Not to say they have to do what those people did, but they can learn from it and apply it. And this is what I want to leave you with, the story of these three girls on the right who heard the story of the folks on the left, Pamela Hines, Dr. Walter Cooper, and Alice Young, all people who fought against racial housing discrimination in our community. When the girl in the middle here heard their stories, and learned about redlining, she said to me after the unit that she thought her school district was racist. She said, I've never had a black teacher, and I don't think we have any black teachers in our school. I said, what should we do about it? And she's like, let's talk to the principal right now. And I was like, well, we could. But what did Howard Coles do? What did Dr. Cooper and Alice Young do? She's like, they got friends together to do it with them. And I was like, and they researched it. They made sure they knew their demands, what they wanted. How many black teachers do you want? What do you know about the current state of our school district? So they came up at lunch every day. They got permission from their parents. They learned on their own. They researched. They had asked questions. I gave them some support, but they did the work. They made a presentation. They found we had 11 black teachers, 550 white. They found we had more black teachers in Henrietta than all the east side suburbs combined. According to Kennedy, that's structural racism, right? So the girls wrote about it, they met with the principal and they told him, this is what we think, this is what we want to change. I wanna graduate having a teacher who looks like me. The girl in the middle, she said, By the, you know, I read statistics that say that if I have one black teacher, my chance of graduating high school goes up 30%. Will you help me have that chance? I'll tell you what. You can't look at a nine-year-old girl with righteous theory and facts on her side and the legacy of Cooper and Alice Young behind her and tell her no. So they spoke to the superintendents, the school board, the community foundation broadcast her story all across the community in their newsletter. And I'm proud to say that our district leaders had courage and they responded. We have a proud relationship with three historically black colleges in Atlanta that were working on developing a feeder patterns. And by the time these girls graduate, they have a teacher who looks like them the teacher that they truly deserve before they graduate. And so leaving you with that story, I'd love to hear your comments and questions, but I also I would really love to have you think about this first question here. How have you been impacted by these policies? How have you benefited? How have you hurt? How have you been hurt? How have we failed to embrace these? How have we avoided them? And then I'd love to hear your questions. But I think that quote that I left you with earlier um, from um, both um, James Baldwin and of course, uh, the great Brian Stevenson, that we have to tell our own stories, talk about how these things happened at our institutions and in our organizations, from schools to theaters, to towns, to governments, to our families like mine, that if we don't look at that, we can't move forward. So I'd love for folks to you know, unmute, uh, share their screen, you know, show themselves, and I'll turn it over to Amy to facilitate um, some conversation. So feel free to type a question in the chat or share your story, or just unmute and jump right in. I'm not sure how you guys usually do this, Amy. I'll leave it to you, but I would really love to hear from you all. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Shane. Now, Bart, um, Don Barnum here is kind of the producer, so he is going to um, mediate, I believe. I, first of all, I want to tell everybody that the reason I was late, I had to make a presentation to the commission. I'm a member of the commission and we had a very important meeting. Uh, to 
Shane, I want to say that I am a lifelong educator and the body of work that you put together uh, has not been seen in this community. And I know tonight was a rough night because of the voting, although that'll go on forever. And I want to tell you that how much I appreciated you coming. I, I just want to give you a couple of minutes to catch your breath. And I think what is remarkable about Shane and about other teachers like Shane, and I wish there were more, he listened to his students and it was from them, from their questions, that he said, I don't know the answer. Let's find out together. But you've put together a beautiful uh, compilation of a program that makes me 100% ashamed. Not the work, not the pictures, not the slides. But what we all went through unknowingly. I grew up in Caledonia, small town, south of Rochester, 5,000 people. I lived on a street with, it led right to the main section. There wasn't a single black family west of the East End by the fairgrounds. And they all lived there. Nobody on my street, nobody on any of the other streets. And I would bet anything, Shane, that their housing areas had the same clause I would bet anything. So we have 20 minutes and I would, Shane, would you like to handle the questions yourself? I, I know I know that uh, sure. yeah, you're very confident, my friend. So I'm gonna back away and please, if you have any questions, um, and I, I've got one to start with. Did you have any trouble gathering the information? Yeah, this is a, a really an eight to nine year journey now of uncovering this research. Um, and I really started about it all wrong. Um, I started by just going on the internet and looking around. And uh, I, like, it, it was a good way to start, but I read articles in the DNC. I read articles from city newspaper, the riots of 64 were really the first place that I kind of learned about because there's lots of articles about that. None of them talked about redlining. And then ta Coates wrote an article in 2012, if I'm correct, called The Case for Reparations that detailed the way redlining segregated Chicago and argued that reparations should be given to people of color in that community and across the country because of the impact. And I was like, what is this? How did I never hear of this? And so I started looking and I went through the footnotes and found this like online little database that had the map for Rochester that you saw in the presentation. And I got a hold of that map. I got in touch with the researchers at the University of uh, Richmond in Virginia and started talking to them, got to look at those reports. And it was just amazing to see that. And then I started looking at those neighborhoods and my searches in the DNC archive started to change. And I started learning about these black activists like Connie Mitchell and Cooper that I'd never heard of. And I found out, you know, Dr. Cooper's still alive. You know, so like I got in touch, I met him, you know, we had dinner and he's become a really good friend. We talk almost every week on the phone. He's 92, he's got a photographic memory. The guy's amazing. There's, I mean, amazing. If you haven't watched any of his, just Google him on YouTube and you could see so many great thoughts. Um, but I, that was the beginning, and then the next part was I realized I needed to get involved in housing activism in Rochester and meet people of color that have been doing this for decades. So I met black activists in Rochester who had worked at FIGHT uh, with their work around housing. 
I joined City Roots Community Land Trust, the Beachwood Neighborhood Organization, and meeting folks that were there helped me ask better questions, helped me refine the search. And that was when I heard about covenants in Brighton. And it was, I only thought, oh, Brighton's the only place, right? And then I went to the clerk's office and I found the Meadowbrook ones and saw Kodak. I was like, what? And then from there, I just got obsessed. I took students down during summer programs with East High School. We would research and then we'd kind of, you know, call out the county clerk to be like, how do we not know about this? You know, and like it became part of City Roots Land Trust and it, it led to story after story. And I've given this lecture over 300 times. And every time I give it, someone's got an email from me with another story that gives me more questions or gives me a better question to ask. I could have done a three hour presentation tonight and talked about you know public housing in Rochester, about 10 other different pieces. But I did wanna just give kind of a snippet and an overview. Um, but yeah, it wasn't easy to find it all, but I think a big, the biggest barrier was just being like a white guy from Webster and realizing I, I had to think, oh, segregation has affected me. I don't have, I don't have any black friends. Like no black people go to my church. Like it, these layers and layers. And then I'm like owning my own story. And just like I said at the end, that owning of my story made the difference. And I appreciate you sharing yours down in helping me start to unlock this and find a way to tell a story with youth, both in city schools and suburban schools that they saw themselves in and were motivated to make change. And again, it's fueled by the student questions that just kept coming. Because every time I find something new, I bring it back to my amazing fourth graders and they would be like, this is, this is great for why? I don't understand. You know, and it just layer on layer. Um, so it's something else. Uh, Ruben said this, uh, great presentation. Glad the info is coming to light and being talked about. Um, a lot of places are doing similar research. Ruben's absolutely right. Similar project like the one we did with the uh, law school here. Washington has one, both DC and Washington State, Seattle. There's some really great stuff, mapping inequality um, out of Minneapolis. Uh, really great stuff that I strongly encourage people to listen to. And I'll also, uh, I can post a link to some of these different sources right here in the chat. Just a second, let me pull that up. Uh, well, he, he, uh, Shane's doing that. You are welcome to turn on your video and audio and join in. Uh, you can put a, uh, put a question or comment in chat. I think there's a hand up icon you can post uh, if you'd like to be called on that way. Uh, let's see, my hand. Hi, Denise, I can hear you. Okay, well, I just, and, and I don't know if you said this, if you, if you, um, but I, I, if it, you did, I did catch whether or not. Now, are some of these things becoming more uh, a part of curriculum in school? So, because, you know, a lot of uh, black people are saying, when you, well, why didn't you know this? How could you not know this? Because they've lived it, mm -hmm. but you've grown up in a, in a very white community you, and you never were taught, you just didn't have, you weren't aware. You know, and I think it's such a critical bit of some information about the inequities, you know, and I think, it, so is it being taught more now in school as part of our? It's a great question. It's being taught. We're trying actively to teach it. So ESL Foundation, United Way, Farish Foundation, many of these people who participated in redlining in our community that funded our project so we can pay our incredible team uh, that's working together as a team to implement these trainings and curriculums across districts. We're, we're working with a number of districts right now. Since, Ju uh, since July, we've trained almost 200 teachers, classroom teachers, in implementing this, going through a three-hour training and then a one-hour training. And then we provide support throughout. Um, we'll work with any district. We have a curriculum that's open source and free for anyone. And our training is completely free. And we'll work with any school district to get this taught um, we're working with private schools, public schools, charter schools. We don't care. Kids need to hear the story, and we're fully funded to be able to do that um, for the community to that support. Some districts are not as interested because I think there's fear that kids can't handle this, and that's been the biggest thing. There's even more fear uh, that white parents are going to be too fragile for it, and in many of the districts, lots of angry white parents have called in and demanded that their student not be taught that their town is racist as if that's really the purpose, is to teach them that Webster's racist. Of 
course Webster has problems with racism. How could it not? <laughs> you saw those covens, right? Of course Pittsford does and Penfield and Rochester. It's not about pointing fingers. It's about telling the truth and helping people see that once it's explained that way to them, once it's told that it's not some teacher getting up and you know lecturing kids on what to think. Kids are looking at the primary sources. They're using strategies like circles to talk about it. It's, it's really, we're, we're weaseling our way in. Last year, me and some of my friends, just volunteer-wise, trained about 250 teachers or so in Webster, RCSD, and Henrietta. And that was a really powerful experience to like work out the basics and allow us to get the funding for this year. And so now that we're professionalizing, we're working with BOCES to try, try to create a package that we can really implement district-wide and getting lots of really great impact, meeting with district leaders regularly. But it's super important that in your school district that you reach out um, to your district leaders and say, we, we want to hear this story, whether it's with the Anti-Racist Curriculum Project or some of the work that the superintendents are doing with the Werner School. It's really important. Amy, we would love to train you. Absolutely. Um, 100%. Anytime. Let me know. Shoot me an email. We can definitely get you at, at one of our next trainings. Um, but it's it's really been cool. We, it started kind of ground up where just teachers who wanted to learn this would invite me to come, kind of like no one was getting paid. It'd be like an after-school book club kind of a thing. And I'd give the talk and talk about how I, I taught it. And slowly we built it and built it. And then it was like too late. You'd have 10 teachers, like I think uh, almost my whole fourth grade team, maybe one of us didn't teach it, um, were like teaching this story, like a five-day unit with their kids. And then it was too late. Like we're teaching this in Russia and Rietta. No one's had blew up. Now, you know, this summer we worked as a district to change our curriculum maps to include this story for fourth grade. But you could easily deepen this story in fifth grade, eighth grade, 11th and 12th grade very easily. And we're working to try to do that with districts. So a lot of districts are in fourth, but not in eighth, 11th and 12th, or second and fifth. And it's the story I told you, it's just a blip. And to do this with kids it needs to layer, just like we do with everything in American history. We learn about World War II multiple times, it's deeper each time, but I do the same thing, I think, with this local history of civil rights and activism as well. So great question, Denise. I hope that helps a little bit. Oh, yeah. Where you live, email your school board. It can't hurt to share the information and encourage them to have the courage to say, you know what, in our town, we want to talk about this. Um, and we believe that kids, um, and we respect kids enough to know that they know we have problems with racism in our community. I don't know any kid that doesn't know that racism is happening now thanks to the activism of Black Lives Matter in our community and free the people, like, let's help explain it. This is the context for that. We can't talk about Daniel Prude without talking about Rufus Farewell or Denise Hawkins or Kelvin uh, Green or Kenneth Jackson, other folks who have been killed in, under RPD custody and I, in red line neighborhoods, just like Daniel Prude was in a red line neighborhood. So it, it layers and it layers. And to me, that's a much safer way to have these really hard conversations that we're supposed to be having with kids. And this is a way to do it safely in a way that helps kids and isn't hurting them. I think that's big. John, did you have a question? I did. Not a question, a comment. Oh, please. And just so, so you don't think your work is all over, Shane. Oh yeah? At the commission meeting tonight, a suburban teacher who is on the education committee said that all of the teachers in her school, she, now she didn't say, but it's definitely a suburban school, uh, took some in-depth professional development on uh, racial inequity and justice and social impact. She said it was excellent. And what do you think happened when they began to use what they learned in the classroom? What do you think happened? They got some serious pushback from parents who said in letters and in person, I don't want you teaching my children racism. And of course, that's not what they were teaching. So what do they have to do? And a good input, I know you probably know this, Shane, but you cannot implement a program like this and not involve your parents 
just as much because it's there. There may not be any contracts or any red lines that we can, you know, in the, in the uh, uh, contract, but it's there. It, it is, it's there. it really is. And so we're, we've done this in East Irondequoit and Webster now where we've trained parents who wanna come you know, open up to parent groups, Good. come in, do the teacher training, see what we're doing with the kids. And we'll do that with any school district's parent group. Well, and, and that's one of the things we're really trying hard to make sure it's done. Right. Parents are sent notes home that detail the way it's designed and show them what the kids are gonna specifically be looking at. So they have a chance to look at it beforehand. And, and I really think that's a big part of it. I, I think the success I've had on my own district is because I've always reached out to parents beforehand and built that oh, trust and relationship. But it's, it's, that's gonna be one of the biggest barriers is that. But just yep. like so many things, after a couple of years, yep. if you stick with it, people stop getting mad and they just accept it. People were mad that we taught slavery in schools. Nobody yep. thinks about it any longer, yep. right? We teach slavery, not very well. We need to do a ton better, but that's one of those things, right? It's like, right. like we can do this. Well, I'll tell you, I want to thank you, and I need to talk to you, but I'll do it by email, and this is really going to be positive for you and your organization, and how much I appreciate it. Uh, is anybody, I know all the people that are here, does anybody want the last word except Denise? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say thank you. And Amy. Yes. Amy and I have worked together on a lot of shows and I had to ask her, but I knew she could handle it perfectly because she has. And thank you, Amy. And we're going to have a show in two weeks on Tuesday and it's going to be pretty exciting. And I'll tell you about it. Okay, Amy. Sure. All right. So Shane, Shane, I just, uh, I would love to be involved in whatever you do to curriculum development if you have need any. I, I teach English, but I'm a historian. And awesome. I would be. Do you know Marissa Privatera? Uh, yes. I, I work over team. in the Webster building, so I never get to see anybody. Oh, but. That's why. Yeah. Definitely shoot me an email. We got to talk. <laughs> okay. That would be great. All right. There's politics, as always, but let's make sure we talk. Yes. And we, we I see you're it. recording the uh, meeting here. Is that yes. going to be available online somewhere? Yes. Yeah. There's I'll, also I'll, a link to it in this link I'm sharing in the chat, too, if you open up that document. Oh, okay. Right at the top. Okay. Is Amy, if you there. send it to me, I can get it to John and Stuart and Isla and Denise. Okay. And I'll send it out to my regulars. I've had a number of requests, you know. Okay. Yeah. Well, and everybody should watch it. Yeah. That's my, <laughs> Thank you so great. much for having me, Don, and everybody. And great. Amy. Yep. Have a great, great job. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, Thank John. You.